Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. And now to your host, Ken Jakes. Hi, everybody. This is Ken Jakes. I'm the host of Democracy That Delivers, our weekly podcast here at SITE. And I'm joined by Lars Benson, our regional director for Africa here at SITE. Lars, thanks for joining us again. Yeah, it's good to be back, Ken. Terrific, thanks. And we're also joined by Rick O'Sullivan. He's the principal of Change Managed Solutions. Rick, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Rick. I'm an economist who is uh, specialized in civil society. I served as the assistant director for the Center for Civil Society Studies at Johns Hopkins, working with Dr. Lester Solomon, who pretty much single-handedly created the field of nonprofit studies. Uh, as such, or in that position, I had the chance to work on what is a lot of the foundational work of what we now understand, how civil society works. Um, I've been working in development now for about uh, 20 years, and a lot of my work has been being brought into projects to help their organizations become self-sustaining and try to change the relationship between civil society, public sector, and the private sector. And Rick, we were talking before the show about that word, sustainability. What does that really mean? What, what, what does that mean in terms of civil society? I think in terms of any organization, it's the ability to move past hand to mouth. Uh, civil society organizations right now live for grant to grant. And um, I consider a sustainable organization one that has sufficient long-term streams of income and multiple streams of income that allow it to do long-term planning. That as long as they're just looking for the next grant or looking for, uh, depending on a single payer or donor, then they're really not sustainable. They're really at the whim of whoever happens to show up with the next checkbook. So we hear a lot of people, and we were talking about this before the program, uh, Rick, uh, that when, when people look at projects, uh, what do they mean by sustainability? Uh, you, you had mentioned that we really haven't seen sustainability. Can you explain what you meant by that? Well, what a lot of people think of sustainability, they think of organizational sustainability. Right. Uh, well, do, do you have a... a, a a well-trained uh, cadre of, of leaders? Do you have a, uh, a, uh, a strategic plan, a mission statement, and all those things which are very nice? Or in terms of donors, when they come in and they set up the project and they leave, the funding's over. Right. Do you exist afterwards? Right. right. And, and that's what no one seems to bother about. Right. You know, the, uh, 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 the problem is that we tend to think of sustainability as an afterthought. Right. Uh, I'm being brought in in the waning months of a pro uh, project, and what I keep you know, is talking about is how it needs to be uh, part of the design initially. You can't wait three years or four years in after this organization, which really is not a civil society organization if it's totally dependent on government grants. It's Correct. A, it's a government subcontractor. Right. But this is an issue that uh, has been going on a long time. I founded and, and chaired the center. Uh, excuse me, the uh, civil society work group at the Society for International Development here in D.C. Uh, for several years. And on our first session, which was in 2010, we went around the room and said, "What is the major concern facing people involved in civil society?" And it was sustainability, sustainability of the organizations, and sustainability results. Uh, Lars, you and I have talked about sustainability a lot. And in fact, we held an event here several months ago. And at the time, it was the largest attended event that we ever had here at SIPE. So it's a, it's a subject that people are really interested in. Uh, tell us from SIPE's point of view, what, what are we doing in terms of sustainability? Um, great. I would say that you know part of this comes down to the type of partners we're working for and somewhat in reference to what Rick was was talking about as we go and we're joining new partners or starting new projects it's really taking a good hard look at that partner and making sure that they are going to be a partner that will be around in 10 15 and 20 years and so part of that involves taking with no help from the outside or with a little help little from the opposite, yeah. Because, I mean, all good donors, they all are going to chase after sort of those successful right. NGOs. And part of the challenge is how do you build up grassroots associations so that they become medium and large 
or how do you uh, work with large organizations that might have been completely dependent upon one source of funding and diversify their revenue streams? Right. Um, Rick, I've, I've read a little bit of your work, uh, social entrepreneurship. Can, can you tell me exactly what that means? In my mind, social entrepreneurship is an organization that is using market forces to achieve a social goal, social objective. Uh, the most obvious of them is uh, the creation of, of standards. Uh, best example that we have uh, that we use is, is Goodweave um, mm -hmm. that tried to change laws to reduce uh, child labor in India in the textile mills and failed miserably. The only people that were getting arrested were the people from, were, with Goodweave um, until they went to the buyers of the, uh, of the, the carpets and the other products that the textile mills were turning out and asked them would they pay a premium for goods that were not uh, – that they guaranteed that there was no child labor. They said yes. They created a standard and then went back and instead of being uh, confrontational, they went in and made an offer. If you, if you can meet these standards, then you can sell in Macy's. So uh, standards is, is one way that uh, uh, it changes the, uh, the dynamic of, uh, of the relationship between the sectors. And uh, instead of just relying and, and, and lobbying government, uh, civil society has to govern. Has to govern. And yes. that's where social entrepreneurship comes in. A lot of people think social entrepreneurship is creating a for-profit business to subsidize a non-profit business. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just a really, really generous for-profit business. Uh, that, um, in, in, that if that's what you do, you, you, you're creating conflicts of interest that will be fatal right. in the long run. Uh, the 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 entre entrepreneurial side of the organization needs to have the same goal as the nonprofit side. Okay. Uh, when you're working with civil society uh, partners, uh, what are some of the steps to ensure they become self-sustaining? Well, uh, first of all, is, is to get them to engage a, as broad a member, uh, a, a range of stakeholders as they can. Okay. Normally, when, when uh, a project goes in and sets up uh, a, a civil society organization, they focus almost completely on the immediate beneficiary, whether it's the members of the association. Right. And by the way, associations don't serve members. They serve their members' markets. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the goal of the association isn't to protect or, or defend their members. It's to grow the market in which they, uh, their members work in. Uh, <clears throat> so it's looking at uh, as broad a range, and I've come up with uh, one of the tools I've created to help organizations become self-sustaining is uh, what I call the CAMP matrix. It, it, it's the four types of stakeholders that all civil society or all nonprofit organizations have, customers, allies, members, and partners. And one of the first things I focus on is don't just focus on your immediate beneficiary, but everyone who will benefit from, from what you're doing and engage them. Uh, one of the th things that's missing, uh, I think, in uh, understanding and development is for a lot of these CSOs, when they, they push for confrontational advocacy to get in front of uh, government and protest, mm -hmm. that the reason this organization exists is because the people they're, they're, they're serving are politically, economically, or socially disenfranchised. Right. And so to say, send these people That's out That's why the they street, join an association in the first place. No one cares what they say. <laughs> right. These are the wrong people. Right. Um, so uh, it's, it's looking at as broad a range of, of, uh, of stakeholders and how you can get them engaged and, and thereby grow a, a domestic base of support. So what are some of the other tools that you use to, to uh, help these organizations become more self-sustaining? Uh, uh, another one I use, I call it uh, the, the three-legged stool of advocacy, mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of organizations, uh, or excuse me, you see in a lot of RFPs, that the role of civil society is to advocate to the government on right. behalf of its clients, members, whatever. Um, but... 
going to the government, there's, there are three ways, excuse me, going to the government should be your, your last step. Mm -hmm. That uh, there are three ways that you can alter people's behavior because that's one of the things that I, I redefine advocacy. Advocacy is not changing laws and policies. The goal of advocacy is to change economic and social behavior. Yeah. Uh, it's like a cultural change, yeah, so to speak. To, to increase transparency, to increase competitiveness, whatever it is that you're trying Edu to call. Educate your stakeholders, what have right. you. Yeah. And, and uh, so in order to do that, there's three ways you can uh, market forces, social uh, pressure uh, incentives, and regulatory restraint. Of the three, the most expensive to get and the least reliable is regulatory restraint. Yeah, and that's our why is that's that? our go-to move. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and that's the first thing you think of when you think of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. You immediately think is they go up to the hill and they lobby government. Uh, you know that that's what you think, and that's what the, the the members think. But you're saying that that's the most expensive and least effective of the of the areas that you've examined. Well, that's what most people think, but actually, if you uh, if you look at associations. Advocacy is only about 10% of their budget. Yeah. And so it clearly is not the most important thing they right. do. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, that, and most of the time when you talk about the U.S. Chamber, uh, they're going up to the Hill to tell the, uh, uh, the Congress, uh, that's okay, sit back, we got this one, and, 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 and manage it themselves. Right, right. Uh, the, the idea that you, you want government – Intervention into your your markets is uh, is is really uh, a, a misconception. You know, uh, the, one of the leaders and uh, leading th thought leaders, I should say, in uh, uh, looking at corruption, Paulo Maro of uh, the uh, uh, IFC, points out every regulation is nothing more than an opportunity for a bribe. So every regulation you ask for, you're giving the government another opportunity to extract money from you. Uh, whereas what you want to do is, what I tell you is do not go in with confrontationally, but collaboratively walk in and say, here's a problem. This is what we're willing to do, and we need you to do that. So you're not going in criticizing. When I was in Afghanistan uh, working on a healthcare project, I met one of the deputy ministers of the uh, Ministry of Public Health. And when I was introduced as the civil society guy, he said, I don't like talking civil society. They only show up to complain and whine. <laughs> yeah. And I said, well, unfortunately, that's what we've taught them to do. <laughs> so, Rick, you mentioned a while ago, and, and I think we do a fair amount of this stuff uh, here, Lars, but you talked about the importance of building in sustainability when you first develop a project, when you first go in and you uh, help set up an, a trade association or, or a think tank or, or, or something like that. So what, what areas should an organization really look at from day one on about how to build that, that sustainability through time it, as opposed to, say, year three? Oh, let's start talking about you know, sustainability right. down the road. Well, I think, uh, first of all, what I, the sustainability the approach I take to sustainability is bottom up instead of top down the way most organizations work. Right. Uh, then, you know, and you wind up with, Budget-driven priorities. This is how much money we can raise. What we can do with that kind of right. money. Right. It's a it, it's a it's a it's a balance sheet thing. Right. As yeah. opposed to what I say is, okay, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. And g tell me each of the activities that you want to uh, uh, execute. And all right, how do we pay for this one? Okay. And then walk through each one, finding the customers, allies, members, and partners who can pay. Mm -hmm. uh, a good example of this, real quick: uh, the Kenyan Medical Association uh, wanted to launch a na nationwide hand-washing project. Mm -hmm. uh, the normal way to do this is go to USA, get a grant, pay for it, uh, and it would be short-term. Instead, what they did was they went to the largest hand soap manufacturer in the, in the region and said, uh, we want you to pay for the production of a PSA. Mm -hmm. And then they went to Nakamat, the largest supermarket in, in, in Kenya, uh, which has screens in the stores that they rent space to their suppliers to advertise their goods and said, we want you to donate space. And they launched this project in, uh, they launched this in 2007. Um, it didn't cost them a penny. They got the PSA, they got it in the stores, 
And the last time I was in Kenya was in 2017. I walked into a Nakamot. You still see it. The end caps are still there. I would yeah. love to see a USA project yeah. that's still going 10 years yeah. later. And, and Rick, <laughs> who wins from all of that, from that approach? Everybody. Everybody. And that's, that, and that's what I meant by look at the broader stakeholders. Exactly. It's looking, uh, you know, we were working in, uh, also in Kenya with a, a project, uh, with, excuse me, a drill welling, a well drilling uh, association. And we said, look at who your, your stakeholders are and, and, so, and, and don't look at, and this is important, don't look at what your organization does but, or what your members do. Look at why they do it. Right. And they were looking at um, their, their members as, well, they, deal, dr they dig wells. Said, no, what they do is they increase local communities' access to fresh potable water. Mm -hmm. This is a, an extraordinary health care benefit. Mm -hmm. Do not go and complain to the ministry uh, to the local municipalities because the biggest problem was the uh, the uh, the bribes were being extracted to to drill the wells. I said, don't go fight them. You can't win. Go to the Ministry of Health and mm -hmm. say because of this barrier, mm -hmm. you're you're not looking good. You know, I'm glad you bring that up because this is what I talk about in communications all the time is always think about the benefit of the end user. What are they really looking for? Because mm -hmm. if you can't sell that, they're not going to listen in the first place. Get away from process. Get to talking about impact. And I think that's exactly what you're right. saying here as well. This is questions kind of goes to both of you. What are some of the trends that are going on uh, in building sustainability in civil society organizations in large I think for, in large part, for what I can see, I, there are a lot of different organizations trying different things. Um, I would also say that in this industry, if we want to talk about the nonprofit industry, there is also a lot of, well, this is the way that things were done in the past. There's not a tremendous amount of innovation yet in terms of civil society really taking a good hard look at what they need to do to become sustainable. And so what happens? In some countries where they're not so democratic and the government wants to crack down on civil society, they come up with NGO laws, which essentially limit their ability to uh, acquire foreign funding. Um, other times they come up with very restrictive type of uh, regulation, which is in terms of how they have to go about and register and how they are controlled. So if we're, we really want civil society to be one of the three pillars in, in every society, then we really need to start thinking a little bit differently about how this is done. There's a lot of uh, the phrase sustainability is quite popular now. There are quite a few different definitions, but it really comes down to something that Rick was touching upon, which is you need to build the organizational culture, the leadership, the governance structures, and the revenue streams internally for each and every organization, whether they're very large or small. And you have to also redefine how they communicate and how they engage with outside stakeholders. Well, well to get back to your a point while ago uh, about uh, this, the, the, the hand cleaning, it's also taken a completely different approach on how they, how they uh, communicate as well and really, really think outside the box. And I hate using those terms like outside of the box, but it really does. Because it's things like that that really, I think, leads to sustainability. Because that's a perfect example. And I love talking about real life examples where it didn't cost a penny, but yet it's still going on. And I guess that's been for 11 years, 10 years, yeah. something like that. I mean, that, I mean, that's terrific. What uh, success stories have you seen in the work we've done here at SITE uh, on sustainability, Lars? Well, SITE, in Africa works very, very closely with nonprofits, but uh, also business associations and chambers. And so part of the success that we're starting to see um, is helping these organizations uh, really start to do things differently. And that's about all about change uh, leadership and change management. And it's not SIP, it's all of our local partners that are implementing various phases of this. So from an organization called Uniqua in Senegal, that SIP has worked with for over 10 years. Uh, they were very, very successful in terms of representing the informal economy, and now they have a seat at the table for any government policy that relates to small business. When we start to take a look at the chamber systems in Ethiopia and Kenya and Zimbabwe and elsewhere, it's really, again, about 
taking a good hard look at what the each organization is doing and what can they do differently and our impacts are you know are numerous across the continent um, in terms of helping organizations become more sustainable. Rick, what's the biggest obstacle that you see in uh, creating a sustainable ecosystem for an organization? What advice do you give them in terms of the things that they need to do to make sure that they're going to be sustainable five, ten years down the road? Well, I, I think the biggest obstacle is getting everyone on the same page in mm-hmm. terms of the role of civil society. Uh, working with uh, with SIP, with a, uh, a woman entrepreneur association in uh, in Palestine, we uh, worked with them to come up with a business model uh, to become self sustaining. Would have reduced their donor dependency from ninety five percent to thirty percent in two years. Uh, so donors don't go away completely, but they. And play when did the project role. start? Uh, well. I think it was 2008. Okay, so it's been a decade or so. Yeah, but uh, they, it was working with them, and uh, they had come up with this plan themselves. It wasn't something that we dropped in front of them Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to find ways to to, uh, help their members become more competitive. And they had this this plan, uh, this business plan in place, and they started moving on it, and six months later, some other donor, I won't mention the name, came in with uh, and dropped a uh, uh, a check for about five hundred thousand dollars on their desk, uh, and he used to say this sustainable uh, plan went into the into the hopper. Uh, I think one of the, the the keys needs to be to change how we view civil society. I think it's a, a key barrier, and, and, and not as the Socratic gadfly. I. I keep hearing that this is, you know, it's the watchdog. It's a gadfly. I, I, I think I'm the only one in development who remembers how it ended for Socrates. The, uh, uh, that by creating this confrontational relationship, we are contributing to the closing of civil society space. That we need to change the, how, how we view a civil society and government as, as being more collaborative. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, to to don't what I tell you, do not go in with a problem or or criticism. Go in with a solution. And the best example of that I saw was in uh, Afghanistan. It was uh, the uh, Afghanistan Midwives Association. Mm-hmm. I was dealing with several medical associations. All the others went in and complained. Uh, the midwives showed up and said, "We have a problem, mm-hmm. Afghanistan." Uh, the highest maternal mo- mo- morality, uh, mortality rate in the planet, and our members can fix it for you. We have standards, uh, we have a training program, and we have a certification. All we need the government to do is use our certification when they're hiring midwives in the public hospitals. That's it. And they were the only ones who could get meetings <laughs> uh, with, with the ministry. And so it's, it's changing and taking responsibility themselves. I, I find it, uh, when you talk about empowerment, we talk about empowering these organizations. If all they're doing is going in and getting the government to do stuff, that's empowering the government. Right. Um, I find it illustrative that in French, the word for empower, uh, to empower is responsibilize. You aren't, you aren't empowered until, until you take, take responsibility, responsibility yeah. <laughs> for the outcome. Right. You know, we've talked this entire half hour on improving sustainability with uh, civil society organizations. But what about the donor community? How has their view on sustainability evolved, say, in the last 20 years or so? And based on a lot of stuff I'm just hearing from you, Rick. I don't think it has. Um, very recently, for example, I was in, a, uh, uh, I was in Jordan, and there was a, a project that was working on uh, – microfinance. Mm-hmm. And I happened to walk in when they were training women and I said, why are you doing this? There are two women business associations in, in Jordan. You should be running it through them. And the chief of party said, you're absolutely right, but we're being assessed on how many people get trained mm-hmm. and how many, uh, how many loans get uh, the applied. The process again. And uh, if we spent time training trainers and shifting, because what I said is you know, they could charge for this, you can't. And this would be a revenue stream, mm-hmm. a, a long-term revenue stream that would continue after the project ends. said, so our numbers would suffer. 
Mm, interesting. Any thoughts, Lars? I, I think that, you know, I think that the donor community is actually talking about this, as we've seen in interest in terms of some of the SIPE uh, events. There yes. are other SIPE. Yeah, it's, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, the, the SIPE event that we held on this uh, uh, six months ago or whatever it was, it was the largest attended event we've ever had here. So it's, it's a topic that people are really interested in, and most of those people from government. Right. And I would say that donors as well, they're starting to explore and experiment. But we're really, I don't think that the book has been written yet on how you do this properly. Right. But I'm working on it. <laughs> you're, you're working on it. That's, that's your next one, right? Yeah. Uh, we're about out of time. Uh, I'm going to jump on our time machine and go five years down the road. So, Rick, if you're going to come back five years from now, what will we be talking about? What we'll be talking about, what I'd like you to be talking about. Let's, let's put on your optimist hat. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think what we need to be talking about is when you, as organizations be, develop more domestic resources, mm -hmm. how does that change the relationship between the donors and civil society? Because they are not going, it's, it's no longer, well, we're going to pay you to do this. It's working more collaboratively with them as, as equals. Uh, as they develop more independent sources of revenue, and that's one of the things we talk about is a portfolio approach, uh, not just grants, uh, but FIFA service and other activities, sponsorships, et cetera, um, that when, once they have these revenues coming in and donors are only 5 or 10% of their revenue, uh, then the relationship between the donor community and local CSOs has actually flipped. Mm. Interesting. Lars, what do you think? Five years from now. I think that we're going to be, it depends on the country. I mm -hmm. think in some countries uh, we will see sort of uh, civil society take a new, uh, this challenge and this opportunity. And where will that happen? That will be, happen where there's been closing civil society space. Uh, I th don't think that, uh, you know, if we take a look at what happened in Russia or what happened in Ethiopia or other, many other countries, I think that it's about how do you, when you start again, building up civil society, it, people will remember the lessons of the recent past and right. try to do things differently. Right. Go ahead, Rick. I'm sorry. You're getting ready to say something? I was going to say uh, that when you're talking about uh, this, I, I think we need to take advantage of a crisis uh, mm -hmm. more frequently. Uh, I had suggested to some from back during the, uh, the Arab Spring uh, that when you have a change in government when the, after the revolution, then is the time for civil society to step up and say, you guys are really busy. We will take responsibility for this, this, and this, and take stuff off their plate when they're amenable to it. Um, a couple of years ago, I was, I was in Tunisia, and they complained. They said, we had a revolution. We threw, uh, threw the, these guys out. We brought new guys in. We got the same problems. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, it's structure, conduct, performance. You have new people, but you didn't change what they do. Right. So you're going to wind up with the same result. Yeah. So I, I think it's a, a, an, an object lesson now that we're looking at Libya. Mm, yeah. uh, next door is, okay, after all the furniture has been knocked over, now is the time to get bold, mm -hmm. not conservative. Right. Yeah, don't, don't repeat the past and do the same things that you were doing in right. the past. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Rick, where can our listeners find out more about change management solutions? Uh, well, we have a website, uh, and it's uh, www.harnesschange.net. And uh, my email address is rosullivan at harnesschange.net. And we'd love to hear from anyone in their comments from, from the podcast. Oh, terrific. So I'm going to leave the last word with you, Rick. Any, any parting, parting wisdom? Um, I would say key to, uh, to sustainability is looking more at, uh, at civil society as a part of the governance process. Mm -hmm. I think it's in, instructive that uh, when you look at de Tocqueville in 1832 in the Democracy in America, he referred to American associations and civil society as America's free schools for democracy. Not because they lobbied the government, but because they governed. And by taking on the responsibility for managing social and economic behaviors, that's where the revenue comes from. Uh, and that's where the, uh, the opportunity is. And so key to sustainability 
is what I call rebalancing the, the roles of civil society, private sector, and public sector, and not lean as heavily on public sector and uh, regulatory enforcement as we have been in the past. Well, Rick, thank you so much for coming in. This has been really enjoyable, and it went by very fast. I mean, we could probably spend another half hour talking about this at least. <laughs> at least. Uh, Lars, thanks again, and uh, we'll see everybody next week. Take care. Great. Bye. Thanks, Ken. You've been listening to Democracy That Delivers. For more information about the Center for International Private Enterprise, please go to our website at cipe.org. That's C-I-P-E dot org. Thanks for listening.